welcome folks. We'll just give people a minute or so to uh, join the webinar before we kick it off. All right, welcome everyone to the second iteration of LF Networking's new webinar series. Today we're going to be discussing uh, building the future open networks, how LF Networking provides the building blocks. We've got four panelists today, um, Abhijit Kumbare, Shakir Al-Hakim, Davide Kerbuni, and Rani Haibi. They all come from LFN member organizations and they're going to be giving, them, giving an introduction of themselves before they speak. Before we kick things off, just a couple of quick housekeeping updates. Um, all attendees will be muted during the session. However, we encourage a Q&A. So if you have questions, there is a Q&A window. Feel free to type those questions anytime during the session. And the speakers, uh, depending on the question, may interject with a response, but we do have time at the end where we will go through all of those. All right, without further ado, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Ronnie to kick things off for us. Thanks, Jill. Uh, hi, I'm Rani Haibi. I'm a director in Samsung's Global Open Source Group and also a member of the LFN Technical Advisory Council. Let me start by uh, saying a few words about what the Linux Foundation Networking is and who we are. <clears throat> the Linux Foundation Networking, or LFN for short, is an umbrella organization supporting a set of open source projects related to networking. It has an ever-growing community of developers who collaborate on improving and expanding the projects. The Technical Advisory Council of the LFN, or TAC, or TAC, has representatives from various projects. <clears throat> its role is to facilitate communication and foster collaboration among the projects. The TAC works in the open through regular meetings, wiki space, and mailing list. Our goal is to share expertise among the participating projects and through that improve the overall quality and value of the software. The TAC recently published a technical white paper that discusses the roles and of the projects in building modern networks. The paper discusses the entire networking ecosystem consisting of open source projects, standards, and commercial projects. This webinar provides a glimpse into the content, but reading the full white paper is recommended for getting the broader view. If we can go to the next slide. Let me start. Um, so to understand the need for open source networking, let's look at how networks were built during the past few decades. Typically the network operators or communication service providers acquired standard compliant technology from network equipment providers, uh, often referred to as vendors. In most cases, the technology was proprietary based on software that was not available in the form of open source code. Innovation tended to happen slowly and at high costs. The traditional model become, became unsustainable with the exponential growth in demand for bandwidth, extended reach to new locations and new devices. Think about IoT, for example. There is a price pressure as consumers expect to pay less for the services, yet get more, more bandwidth, more coverage and more devices. Other industries such as web scale or enterprise software adopted a more open model of innovation. There is a desire in the networking industry to follow such models and reap the same benefits, hoping to get better quality software and faster innovation as there is an open and common platform for collaboration. You go to the next slide, please. So why is the open source approach more efficient, you might ask? Let's take a look at the traditional process of building networks. It started with requirements for a new type of service or technology, then standard development organizations or SDOs 
got together to specify the architecture, protocols, interfaces, and flows required for the new service. Once that work was complete, network equipment vent providers could each take the specification and create their implementation. Despite the best of intentions, standard left a lot for interpretation. So each vendor's implementation ended up being slightly different than the others. This required a process of interoperability testing, sometimes referred to as bake-offs or plug fests. Each iteration of this process required going back to the implementation, making adjustments and improvements, and repeating the interoperability testing. Sometimes the finding during this process required going all the way back to the standards and making adjustments there. Finally, when all the issues were ironed out, the products were ready for deployment. If we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see how does open source software streamline the process. Uh, there are several aspects to that. First, the work on open source software can start in parallel to the standardization. Open source software development is dynamic and agile, allowing fast trial and error iterations. Vendors and operators may experiment with ideas even before they officially get standardized. The SDOs may use the open source project as a testbed in which they trial their innovative ideas. There is a constant loop of feedback between the standards and the open source implementation, helping the open source projects produce software that is aligned with the standards from day one and enabling the SDOs to validate their new concepts, leading to better quality standards. Network equipment vendors may start working on their product implementation using early drops of the open source software. This way, they do not have to wait for the standards to be finalized. Vendors will begin from a common core software, significantly reducing the chance of incompatible interfaces. As a result of this process, deployment of new technology and services by the communication service provider can happen much earlier than before. Can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Let's speak about the role of the LFN. Uh, the LFN's mission statement is to increase the availability of quality open source software for networking <clears throat> with the goal of reducing the costs of building and managing networks. The LFN offers benefits to both the communication service providers as well as the network equipment providers. For the communication service providers, benefits include better control over their network and product roadmap, uh, faster time to market with new services, increased security, and eventually reduced costs. If we go to the uh, next slide. Open source is not meant to take network equipment providers out of business. On the contrary, it offers several benefits that help them remain competitive and bring value to their customers. This includes reduced costs through sharing of the burden with the community, a platform for direct interaction with their customers or potential customers, and an opportunity to become part of a multi-vendor ecosystem. There are benefits for everyone, uh, whether it's communication service provider or network equipment providers who actu actively participates in open source creation. Research shows that active open source participation, participants learn how to better use the software in their environment, and they also see boost in their productivity. If we go to the next slide. Uh, here you can see just some of the standard definition organization, SDOs and other open source projects in the networking ecosystem. You can see the LFN projects highlighted with green frames in this diagram. As mentioned before, the open, open source in general and the LFN in particular is not aimed at replacing standards. In fact, the LFN is working closely with SDOs and this work is visible in the form of either coordinators that share knowledge between project and SDOs in, bi in a bi-directional manner. Uh, you can see signing of MOUs, memorandums of understanding uh, between the LFN and SDOs indicating the commitment for alignment. And occasionally we are publishing technical white papers that highlight the alignment between the different initiatives. The LFN projects constantly, constantly maintain alignment and integration with the entities shown in this diagram. Uh, 
This ensures that the provided software is aligned and compatible with other elements of modern networks. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, here we can see the Elephant projects and the functionality related to the different layers required for building a modern network. So starting from the bottom with the transport layer, also referred to as the data path, uh, where speed and reliability are key. The FIDO project focuses on fast packet processing. FIDO's work applies to multiple layers of the network from layer two to layer seven. The next layer up is network operating system, where the essential software components required for building a network device are integrated and packaged together. The OpenSwitch project abstracts the complexity of hardware implementation details of network devices and exposes a unified interface towards the higher network layers. Next, the network control layer is where ONAP, Open Daylight, and Tungsten Fabric take network service definition as input, break them into their more basic building blocks, and then interface with the lower layers of the network to instantiate and control the service. The top layer of the network functionality includes the components which provide visibility into the state of the network as well as automated network management. Panda and SNAS can collect high volumes of network data in real time and make it available to external management systems. All the collected data can also be used by ONAP uh, and its policy-driven control loop, which automates and dynamically controls the network in response to changing demand. Hey, Ronnie, we, sorry to interrupt. We had a quick question about which project is the CICD layer here? Uh, so the CICD refers to mostly OPNFV and, and the CNTT initiative. Great, thank you. Which brings me to my last point about OPNV and CNTT, um, uh, which focus on the integration of the different layers. Uh, they provide tools and reference architecture for building networks. In addition, they provide verification programs for network infrastructure and for the virtual network functions. They ensure that the different components of the network are fully compatible with each other. Uh, next slide, please. It's important to remember that each project under the LFN may be used as a standalone and provide full and rich functionality in the domain it's targeting. There are currently eight projects under the LFN with plan to add more in the future. Obviously, we cannot go into the details of each project today, but we do have two representatives on this webinar from two projects, Abhijit and Chakar. So in the next part of this webinar, we will talk about ODL, Open Daylight, and ONAP. We will highlight what value they bring and how their open interfaces may be used to build the broader network solution. So with that, I'll hand it over to Abhijit. Yes, this is Abhijit Kumbare. I'm uh, the TSE chair for Open Daylight Project. Uh, uh, I have been involved with Open Daylight Project since its inception in 2013. Uh, and uh, I Actually, even before that, uh, when it was getting formed, uh, and uh, it's been quite a nice journey. And uh, uh, I think we'll just go through a little bit uh, one by one of it, parts of it in, a, in a, as small time as possible. Mm. So, Open Daylight, as such, is it was Linux Foundation's first attempt at a networking project, and it was the first project brought in like where networking companies, vendors, uh, and uh, the providers came together and created a project in open source uh, for the, uh, uh, in, in the Linux Foundation. Uh, and this project is now part of the LSN umbrella. Uh, and as I said before, it was founded in 2013. Uh, we just completed the 12th release in April called Magnesium. We actually follow the the naming convention for the, the elements in the periodic table. Uh, so this was a decision that we had taken at the start of the project, uh, uh, where we started with hydrogen, then we followed with helium, etc. Uh, so since there are since the release cadences around six monthly, 
we have given us ourselves around 50 years to so we are uh, unlikely to run out of uh, the release names in any time in the future uh, as such open daylight is also the most uh, widely deployed open source sdn controller mm, I, and overall it's a modular platform for customizing and automating networks of any scale, size and scale uh and right from the beginning we designed it such a way that uh, it can be a foundation for commercial solutions to address various types of use cases not just a particular use case and uh, in here we will i will just cover a partial list of use cases and uh, if your favorite use case is not here uh, we'll cover it later on you can uh, contact it me with uh so going on to the open daylight architecture uh the key pieces the key uh, two key aspects of open daylight architecture that we need to look at as is first the architecture it is a model driven architecture instead of a hardwired architecture uh so what that means is uh, uh in a hardwired architecture we could have taken uh for programming networking devices via different protocols we could have taken the existing apis for the different plugins uh, we could have, we would have got different plugins for the different pro protocols to to program the different protocols and we could have come up with an api abstraction that meets all of their needs and so that would have been a much more complicated process and less flexible and more prone to errors so instead of that we came up with this model driven approach where the sdn applications actually deal with software models of network devices uh, instead of dealing with the networking devices themselves via um, so so the application deals with uh, with the model of that uh, and then uh, they that will deal directly deal with the device itself uh, so everything inside of the Uh, is represented as models so even the open daylight applications uh, and services are represented as models and these interactions between the models are processed within what is the center of the uh, or the kernel of the open daylight platform uh, or called as md sal or model driven sal uh, so the, the that is md sal is uh, is probably the the key reason for the open daylight longevity and Uh, and flexibility the second aspect of the open daylight architecture is the framework is quite modular and multi protocol uh, so it allows developers and users to install only the protocols and services that they need rather than uh, uh, everything under the sun uh, and uh, you can also combine multiple services and protocols to solve more complex problems as the needs arise Uh, and uh, the bottom line because of this is that due to this uh, we can uh, uh, it it allows us to do variety of use cases as, as i mentioned before uh, so just uh, just to understand how the md sal helps you develop applications is uh, once the first step you would do is you would define your model for that application or for the device uh, or the device type mm, and yang is used for the modeling of this you compile that model with a piece of software inside of open daylight called yang tools uh, and the compilation results in the skeleton of the application uh, including the rest api and uh, uh, and the model itself uh, and if you look in the diagram in the middle on the side uh, so uh, uh, the elements in the red color are the application skeleton that that the yang tools has compiled for you uh, and the model implementation green is where you actually have to write your code write your uh, uh, handlers notifications and uh, interfacings etc and uh, do whatever your application needs to do next slide please so as far as uh, the use cases 
So we have, uh, so I'm covering a few of the use cases. So the first use case I'm covering is ONAC, uh, or specifically the ONAC components SDNC and AppC. Uh, these are extended from Open Daylight Controller Framework to manage the state of the resources, so network resources. Uh, so SDNC is used for the layer one to three network elements, uh, and AppC is used for the, for the, the network functions, the layer four to seven, like the load balances, et cetera. And this is done via the, the state of resources done via application level configuration via netconf, share sensible, et cetera. Or it is done via the lifecycle management. Uh, and, and it's also does the lifecycle management, stop, resume, health check, et cetera. So the diagram to the right, it, uh, it shows how SDNC is leveraging the open data framework, including the API handlers, operational and configuration trees. Uh, adapters, etc., uh, and this diagram is uh, it's pretty dated, but it uh, it does show how uh, how Open Daylight is actually used inside of the SDNC framework. Next, next slide. Please. The second use case is uh, the network virtualization use case for cloud and NFE. Uh, so in this, uh, the Open Daylight Network app can be used to provide network virtualizations, uh, basically overlay connectivity inside of, inside and between the data centers for the cloud SDN use case. Uh, so it will let you create the VXLAN tunnels uh, within the data center and layer three VPN tunnels across the data center. So you can have a seamless, uh, seamless network virtualization. Next slide, please. So the last slide I'm talking about is the use case called network abstraction. Uh, so Open Daylight can expose uh, network services API for uh, for not bound applications for network automation in in a multi vendor network. So this is a bit of a problem for uh, uh, for vendors or rather uh, for uh, uh, web 2.0 companies and things like that who own network devices from different vendors and it's hard to uh, configure them separately uh, and to have a single automation. Uh, and to that end, actually a new project inside of Open Daylight uh, was, uh, uh, was created last week. Uh, it's, uh, the, the effort has been going on for a while. so. I did not have this part in the white paper, but uh, it, it is exactly the instantiation of the network abstraction case. Uh, and the project is called Open Data Service Automation Framework. And that is for providing the heterogeneous device management. Uh, so you could, uh, you could program the vendor devices with inter varying interfaces, CLI, et cetera. So on the diagram on the right, the, the two diagrams on the light, right, uh, one it shows is how uh, how you are interacting with the CLI devices, and the other diagram is showing how you could use the ODL SAF to interact with the NetConf devices and use the same uh, same kind of framework to do that. So this uh, actually is to simplify the service provisioning, and uh, the second thing is. Uh, that is actually needed in the network automation processes is uh, transaction management capability for uh, device service provisioning. Uh, so that is pre-check of the configurations that you are going to send, uh, post-check if the configurations actually succeeded, and if there was any failure, a rollback of, uh, of the, uh, the configurations. So that's where my things are. I will hand it over to Anak. Okay, thank you, Abhijit. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shakra Hakim. I work for a, a company called FutureWay. FutureWay is based out of uh, Santa Clara, California, where I'm an executive director uh, for open source and for virtualization. Um, I am also the within the LFN community. I am the chairman of the architecture subcommittee of the ONAP project, and I am also a member of the TAC, the technical advisory committee of the LFN Edge, which is uh, another uh, component or project under the LFN umbrella. 
um, what I uh, will uh, uh, present in the next few graphs is uh, the ONAP platform. And before I, I start, I'll give you a little bit of history of ONAP. ONAP was um, uh, created back in the day, uh, back in 2013, when I was uh, a closed source with a major service provider. And uh, basically I was there since day one. And then when it became an uh, open source project under the LFN umbrella, uh, and it evolved to where it is today. So I've been with the project uh, for for a while. So I do have a very good background in, in terms of where the project started, where it is today. So with that, let me, um, I'll take you through some of the view graphs. I will explain to you at high level what ONAP is. We'll go into some of the components and then we'll give you a view of the benefits of ONAP or where we are today with the, um, with the current release. So what is ONAP? Sorry, if you could go back. Thank you. Uh, what is ONAP? It's uh, the Open Network Automation Platform a project. And the reason that it was created it was to address the a common uh, orchestration in automation, you know, for the service, the, the service providers domain, uh, where uh, you may have a multitude of uh, network elements uh, that may or may not be from the same vendor. So ONAP was created to basically create a common way to orchestrate virtual functions across multiple uh, uh, vendor base uh, and to also provide a lifecycle process and also to support the DevOps model. Next um, slide, please. So, what ONAP does is, um, is the following. It provides the service providers, mainly large per service providers, but you know, also uh, smaller service providers with the ability to dynamically introduce a new service um, or a full service lifecycle in orchestration. And what we mean by it is you have the design, how the service is designed using a well tested and well-defined uh, VNFs or virtual functions to, uh, to the way the service gets created and um, using an abstraction layer that can create the service from any uh, uh, vendor in any VNF without uh, impacting the, uh, the way the service gets designed. Uh, and then once the service is designed, it gets uh, basically uh, orchestrated and after the orchestration you have the you could set the policies and you could set the control loop and now you have a, a, a service that is fully deployed um, in an automated fashion and then it um, uh, you have your policies and you have the control control loop that basically handles the lifecycle management of the service the api's that are provided are open api's um, the the underlying technology is model driven, so um, you can change the the way um, you know the type of VNFs that you're using, uh, the type of uh, platform that you're orchestrated on, and the fact that you have common APIs and common uh, data model. It gives you the flexibility to do that seamlessly. Uh, it is. The scalability of ONAP is carrier grade, uh, which includes the horizontal scaling and the distribution to support a large number of services and large networks. Uh, that's basically, uh, that was the basic premise of um, ONAP. It is a metadata driven and policy driven architecture. Um, it does uh, allow for a significant flexibility in the way uh, virtual functions are uh, the process of what orchestration, the virtual function um, a, or the services it is automated and the ability to do that in a very expedited and uh, in efficient fashion. The architecture allows for uh, the best in class, the, in source, the sourcing of the best in class components. You could pick and choose which components you want to use, which component, which VNF do you want to use, how do you create the, uh, the service using, you know, 
mix and match. Um, the the architecture of ONAP is perfect uh, for that type of uh, for those types of functionalities or uh, capabilities. Um, it allows you to basically develop once and and deploy many. You could basically create a template or a recipe to deploy a specific vir virtual function or, vir or virtual service, and you could use and reuse that function, that template, or that recipe to deploy many instances of the same service or the same virtual function. And the last but not least. Um, it does support elastic scaling as needs grow or shrink. So you basically could add resources on the fly. And then if the resources are no longer needed, you could basically uh, reclaim these resources and put them back in the inventory and use them for a different service or for a different VNF. Next slide, please. So this, what is the scope of ONAP? There are two paradigms within ONAP. You have the design, uh, the design time and what we call the runtime. So you have this design time framework that allows the service provider to basically create any service, uh, design any service and create any service based on their needs and based on the type of VNFs that they're planning or PNFs for that matter. And we call them XNFs uh, based on their needs and they compose the service, service gets composed, you don't have a time frame for composing the service. You could take whatever time you need to compose it. Once the service has been composed and uh, created, then a uh, the bundle of that service is created and then passed on to the runtime framework. And the runtime framework has two major components. One is the service deployment, which is how do I orchestrate the service? How do I make sure the service is up and running? How do I inventory all the resources that are associated with the service that I just orchestrated? And once that is done, then the control is passed on to the operation sides of the service that was created. And now the data collection analytics takes place. The, um, uh, you know, from the data collection and the analytics, then you could derive whether you, uh, you have an issue or not with the service. Um, you have a policy and you have a policy engine and a set of policies that you would have designed during design time and those will take over and then will allow you to autonomously monitor the system uh, and monitor the application and basically be able to recover from a many uh, failures by using the, uh, the, the closed loop uh, automation or the closed loop notion that is part of the service design and creation. Next page, please. Uh, taking taking the uh, the architecture uh, down one level of detail, the uh, the left side, which is the side that is outlined with the uh, with the in red, is basically the service the service design part and the creation part of the uh, of the own app service that's the com the component that allows you to create the service and as you can see there there are many sub components in own app is very very uh, a large system so the service design creation has all these components that are used during the service uh, design creation including the catalog and the way you do the data collection analysis and, and analytics the way you onboard the XMFs and so on and so forth. So that piece, once that piece is done, and this piece is totally independent of the orchestration, right? You could take, you could design many services at the same time, and when that service is ready, then you could basically push a button, and you that service gets um, uh, gets moved over to the orchestration part, and it gets created. But the key over here is the the way you plan on the onboarding process right it is you need you need people that are familiar with your services you need people that are familiar with the vnfs you need people that are familiar with your target environment whether it is an internal cloud or an external cloud and all those these items are basically part of the service design and creation process once you do that then you have to basically understand what resources you need and how the service gets composed then you do the distribution piece, which is, you know, the service is bundled and then you, the service gets distributed and the way it gets distributed is in the form of what we call a SAR, SAR service archive, which is a Tosca based 
that gets passed from the service uh, design creation in onto the orchestration and the um, and the operational part. Next, please. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So now, once the service gets deployed, it's called service deployment. Then you and again, what you see here is all the major components of ONAP, and there are eleven or twelve major components. The service gets the uh, uh, deployed to the orchestration, uh, to the runtime environment, and that's where the orchestration steps start to take place. The orchestrator, which is in the middle box that is labeled service orchestration or SO, takes over and then it coordinates all the or orchestration steps that are needed. You know, it needs resources, it knows where to get the resources, it determines where to deploy the service based on the way the service was designed. It understands what the network topology should be. So it passes the control to the SDN controller to create these network topologies. And what Abhijit said before is that the SDN controller is basically um, a, um, is a custom developed for ONAP, but it actually runs within the ODL container and so does the app C, which is adjacent to it right next to the uh, right, the, the, bottom, uh, the bottom row in the, in the diagram. So once all these steps have been executed, the, one of the last steps that the uh, service or orchestration does, and which is a very critical step, is to inventory all the resources that have been assigned to that specific service into the element or the component that is called active and available inventory, A and AI. The A is for active, and those are all the resources that are that have been used up. And the second A is available, and these are the resources that are available for the orchestration to be able to use in case they need to, it needs to orchestrate another uh, service or another VNF. And once that is done, then the VNF is up and running and then data collection uh, begins. And once the data collection starts, then the analytics piece starts to take over because there, they, you have a, a set of microservices that are doing the analytics, they're working on the data collection, on the data that's been collected, and they determine, these analytics microservices determine whether the, there is an anomaly that was detected in, if there is an anomaly, they understand how to access the policy engine, which is the, um, uh, the uh, which is yet another component in at the top, the second from the left uh, top component, the policy framework. And the policy framework, framework works very closely with the, with the uh, uh, control loop automation process to make sure that the uh, whatever policy is defined, the control loop will basically implement it. And it could be that the service has gone offline. You send a request back to the uh, service orchestration uh, component. The service orchestration will go ahead and uh, reinstantiate that service. Next step, please. I mean, sorry, next page. So uh, I know that I'm going very fast just because of the interest of time, but just to give you an idea as to what the, um, uh, what the benefits are. Uh, and I, I hope you were able to, um, to see uh, or notice some of the benefits um, when I was presenting the previous biographs. You have a common automation platform, right? That enables common management common of common services, allows for creating network topologies or the connectivities and independent of the, what type of VNF or what type of service you're trying to create. So whatever service you create, you, yeah, it orchestrates for you independent of the underlying technology that you're using or the underlying VNFs that you're using. It, it gives you a unified operating framework. DevOps, it's the DevOps, uh, DevOps model. Yeah, it's a policy driven. It is a model driven. The life cycle is well defined and the life cycle management is basically handled within one component based on the need of the service. It does support both the virtual and physical orchestration of, uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, virtual and physical network, network um, uh, components uh, virtualization. Um, it allows you, it offers you a way to configure the VNFs in you know, well-defined matter. It is a model driven, uh, no matter what you use and what service you're trying to compose and what the VNFs you're trying to use, you have one 
uh, one uh, abstraction. It's called service instance that allows you to uh, basically inventory any service. Um, and, uh, and so that modeling allows also the operators to use the same deployment and management, management mechanisms for all the services that run on the platform. Last but not least, um, the upcoming release, which is uh, coming out in the June release is Frankfurt release and the ONAP uh, releases are named after major cities uh, for uh, associated with major um, uh, company members. Uh, so the next one is the Frankfurt release and it will be available in the June timeframe of this year. And with that, I will turn it over to Davide to take you uh, through the end-to-end -end use cases. Thanks, Chakar. Um, mm -hmm. So my name is Davide Cherubini. I am lead of open source in, uh, in the Vodafone group. And I'm also a member of the Technical Advisory Council of LFN. So in this section, we will present an end-to-end -end use case example where the eight LFN projects, so including the six that have been presented, in this in this present in this slide presentation, are used to together to create an end-to-end -end service, and they will manage the whole life cycle of the service, so the whole design, build, and run. So, but before diving into the example, I I like to to make some some important points from an operator perspective. So, operators normally aim to provide innovative end-to-end -end business services to their customers through repeatable, simple process with high level of automation. Now, operators are also looking for solutions that are enable to innovate quickly and flexibly. So what, what, what an operator is expecting from, from the open source projects? Well, first of all, and most importantly, openness. For example, the adoption of standard open APIs in order to avoid proprietary solutions and, and vendor locking. And most importantly, we are expecting future-proof innovation at pace to quickly adapt to future networks as well as future products and services and to offer the best to our customers. Finally, technical robustness in terms of solutions and also in terms of high availability while embracing modern software development practice like CICD and DevOps. And of course, security is one of the most important pieces. Of course, there are many more uh, things that we, the operators are expecting from the open source communities like, you know, automation, simplicity, reusability of the projects and so on and so forth. So let's dive into, into the end-to-end -end use case. Next slide, please. So it's a very simple example where we, we use the eight LFM projects to work in harmony and to deliver an end-to-end -end service that includes virtual network functions, connectivity, also connectivity to the internet, and an analytics powered uh, closed loop assurance. Of course, this is really just a very simple example and it's, it's a suggestion. The flexibility of the eight LFM projects allow you to adapt this to the use case at hand. Now, uh, in this example specifically, we're going to deploy two VNFs, two virtual network function on top of a net NFE infrastructure, for example, can be OpenStack. These virtual network functions might be interconnected in the manner of the service chain, and they will be provided with an external connectivity to the internet in order to allow the consumption of the VNF to our customers. The, MNF, the network functions also require network acceleration and for data packet processing, for example, and the old service must be assured using analytics-driven closed-loop operations. So it's the old life cycle um, plan, design, build and run that we're going to present. And we structure this use case in three phases. So the first phase is where we're going to build the infrastructure and we're going to prepare the network functions. What does it mean prepare the network functions and build the infrastructure? So as mentioned by, by Renny, uh, there is a project called the C Entity Project, the Common NFI Telco Task Force. And uh, we will recommend you to join one of the next LFN webinars on May 27th, which will be dedicated to CNTT. So following the CNTT reference model, an operator might decide which CNTT architecture, and you will learn this in the, in the webinar, may, may be best for, for the use case. So this is followed by picking a set of infrastructure components that fit in, in the CNTT reference implementation. 
The infrastructure is then built using the deployment tools and the CI CD tools provided by OPNFV, as mentioned by Rennie. Next, the infrastructure is certified using the CNTT reference certification and the OPNFV uh, verified program or OVP. That is part of the LFN CVC compliance and verification. Several LFN projects may be used as infrastructure building blocks for our in order to address the needs of network functions, such as, for example, high throughput or low latency networking. So for example, Open Daylight and Tungsten Fabric can be used as third-party SDN controllers to provide network connectivity. Open Switch can be used to build the physical underlay network that connects the physical servers, the physical hosts. FDIO provides the data plane networking acceleration through its vector packet processing uh, processor, sorry, VPP. The virtual network functions are prepared for deployment and inclusion in network services. How does it work? An NFV vendor pre-validates and certifies two VNFs, say in the example in the picture, VNF1 and VNF2, through the OPNFV verification program, the OVP. The NFV vendor also ensures that each VNF complies with the ONAP VNF requirements, the arrow you see on the top. And this will enable ONAP to properly control the whole life cycle of the AVNF as part of the network service. So once this is, this is ready, we can move into the next phase, which is more the, uh, the ONAP phase in terms of design and, and, and runtime. So as, as mentioned by Chaka, ONAP here is central because it orchestrates the whole, the whole service. So at design time, ONAP, is used on board the VNFs that are compliant with the previous step. Uh, these compliant resources can later be used and reused once they are part of the resource catalog, can be reused to design any type of end-to-end -end service using the ONAP SDC, the service design and creation. At runtime instead, ONAP orchestrates the deployment of the whole end-to-end -end service and the ONAP service orchestrator instructs the underlying ONAP functions, like for example, the SDNC or the AppC, in order to deploy all of the elements that compose the end-to-end -end service. So, for example, ONAP deploys the VNFs on the, on the NFVI, in this case, OpenStack, and creates the overlay network connecting them together, and does that using the ONAP SDNC. Now, also, ONAP SDNC, as mentioned by Shaker, uses the open daylight based architecture to model and deploy the layer one to layer three connectivity. Next, the ONAP AppC is used to configure the network functions and their layer four to layer seven functionality. And as mentioned by Shaka, this is also based on the open daylight architecture. The open daylight itself that you see in the picture may be used to stitch together the physical switch fabric of the infrastructure with the virtual networking in the NFVI. For example, this is OpenStack Neutron. Through the Open Daylight northbound interface, the ONAP SDNC is able to instruct the Open Daylight SDN controller for the underlay network management. Whilst the, the southbound interface of Open Daylight, for example, NetConf, supports interactions with OpenSwitch, another LFM project, running on the leaf and the spine fabric switches in the NFVI. Finally, the SDNC the ONAP SDNC southbound interface also allows to instruct Tungsten Fabric, another LFM project, to create the external connectivity that will in enable the customers to consume the service offered by the two VNFs. The policies that are predefined in ONAP and that will control the life cycle of the network service are designed using the design time components such as the service design and creation and clamp. Next phase is the, is the run phase, is the operation phase, where we have the closed loop operations, right? So in this case, of course, ONAP, again, being the brain or the orchestrator, the automation part of, the, of this example, plays a central low role in the delivery of the assurance of the end-to-end -end assurance of the service. So for example, the VNFs, the virtual network functions, report the performance and fault data to the ONAP DCAE data collection and analytics engine using an interface that we call, is called the VNF event streaming interface, the VES interface. This information is constantly analyzed in ONAP 
it may trigger predefined policies that we have created in design time. The policies are then used to invoke closed loop automation actions, uh, such as scaling, for example, or hearing one of the service components in order to meet the service level agreement that we have with our customers. Finally, the closed loop operations may be further enriched by combining the LFN real-time analytics capabilities such as SNAS.io and Panda.io, which are two additional LFN projects. So for example, um, information about changes in the network topology uh, are, are collected and gathered by, by SNAS. And this information can be used to trigger on a policies that will spawn more instances of the packet routing network functions. On the other hand, the data analytics capabilities of, of Panda may be used to use to trigger on a policies based on data stream produced by all the layers of the infrastructure as well as the network functions. In this case, ONAP may respond to an infrastructure issue detected by Panda by migrating, for example, VNFs from an affected location to one that is healthy and that has available resources. Now, again, this is a real simple example. I'm conscious the time, maybe I was too fast. And of how, for example, the LFN analytics projects can be used in conjunction with ONAP and with all the rest of the, of the LFN family umbrella uh, to meet especially the agreed service level, which is what is important for an operator. Now, this was my last slide, and I would like to hand over back to Rani for the final remarks, and I thank you all. Thanks, Davide. We hope that today's webinar gave you an idea of how the LFN provides the building blocks for modern networks uh, with standard compatibility and open interfaces. The LFN projects are easily integrated with other elements in the network. And network designers may choose to use anything between just one project to the entire set of projects when they're building their networks. So it's not a package deal. And finally, we really encourage collaboration. You may start by just asking questions, proposing ideas, or uh, help with ongoing work. Uh, this uh, getting started link here can guide you through the first steps of your participation but uh, please you're welcome and uh, we always welcome uh, new participant new eyes and, and new ideas um, this concludes the presentation part of this webinar and we will now be happy to address any of your questions thank you great thank you to all of our panelists um, and thank you to all who submitted questions we have several that came in through the chat window um, lots of them are already answered via type uh, but we do have a few uh, questions that we can address in our last few minutes here. So to kick it off, um, somebody is asking, are you working to standardize the APIs between these components? If we want to go to a best of breed scenario today within ONAP, the integration efforts are really big. Yeah, so I think this question came in two parts and I typed the answer in the second half. So, but I'll summarize it to, some of the interfaces within uh, ONAP are already following existing standards where they exist, such as Etsy NFV specifications. And for the others, the APIs are provided, are well documented and of course provided as open source. And we are already seeing some uh, successful use cases where uh, people and organizations are using a subset of the ONAP components uh, successfully using those interfaces yes if i could if i may add we have a um uh we have an effort underway to working with sdos mainly etsy like ronnie just mentioned one for the orchestration piece where you could get an, or an orchestration request from outside on that and the second is for performance management uh data collection through the vest collector that david just mentioned so these are two efforts that are currently being worked on and um, uh, we've done some work in the previous release and we've added new features and functionality, functionalities in the upcoming release. Uh, actually, I, I would also like to add to the uh, things that uh, uh, Open Daylight also has been, uh, has over a period of time uh, been working to standardize Yang models and things like that for a long time, so. 
Okay, so we do work with the standard short conditions. Great, thank you. Um, just a couple of other questions. Um, what's the level of maturity of the projects under the LFN? Are they ready to, to be deployed in production yet? Yeah, so most of them are uh, already being successfully deployed. I think, uh, Abjit, if you can say a few words about Open Daylight and maybe Shakur can mention a few things about ONAP. Yes, so, uh, so, so Open Daylight has been deployed in the production networks uh, for a while now. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the networks are as big as like 1 billion users uh, uh, going through them. Uh, so uh, it's, it's been deployed at different service providers. And as far as ONAP goes, uh, there are a few uh, major companies, service providers, uh, mainly that have deployed ONAP and uh, it's been deployed, uh, I would say for the past uh, at least couple of years. Uh, the company that I used to work with um, I deployed it three years ago and other companies have, um, have been uh, major contributors and have decided to uh, basically have deployed it and have decided to, uh, to make it part of their uh, future uh, direction in terms of orchestrating and deploying new services. So we have a few major companies in North America and a few major uh, ISPs in Europe and in the Far East as well that have made uh, uh, a solid commitment to move ahead with uh, use, using ONAP in their production environment if, they, if they're not using it already. Great. Um, so this will be our last question unless um, if there are any more, please feel free to type them now. Um, but we've been asked uh, if you all think the model of free and open source software is going to drive equipment vendors out of business. Yeah, so I, I think I, I tried to um, address that, but the important thing is uh, open source or software itself is just one part of the product or the solution. Uh, it's an important part, but uh, there is still a need for integrating software, testing it, uh, providing support for it. And this is still the role mostly of uh, the, the classic vendors or new coming vendors. Uh, so yeah, there's room for everyone. We're just uh, collaborating on the creating of the core software, but then each vendor can still differentiate and provide its own unique value on top of that. Okay, great. Well, a big thank you to all of our panelists today and thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, just a quick reminder, the slides will be available tomorrow. Anyone who registered for the webinar will get them via email. And uh, if you have friends or colleagues who might want be interested in this, um, they can watch it on demand at the, uh, the same registration link that you signed up on. All right, thanks again and stay tuned for more webinars coming out from LF Networking. Have a great day, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.